New evidence continues to surface in the death of Trayvon Martin. Even with the new evidence, the question still lingers. Some three months after the shooting, did George Zimmerman shoot and kill Trayvon Martin because he was black? Racial profiling continues to be an issue in communities around the country. But how large a problem is it in Fort Wayne? What are the implications and what can we do to lessen the problem? That's tonight's topic in this News Channel 15 primetime special, Focus 15, Colorblind. Community. Commitment. Coverage you can count on. This is Focus 15 on Wayne TV. Now focusing on the issues affecting Northeast Indiana. Here's your host, Mark Mellinger. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. We are sitting down with a panel of plugged in people to explore the issue of racial profiling in Northeast Indiana. To what extent is it an issue here? We will hear from local leaders in law enforcement, politics, academia, and more. But joining me now to begin our broadcast is the president and CEO of the Fort Wayne Urban League, Jonathan Ray. Jonathan, thank you for coming. Always good to have you here. Appreciate being here, Mark. What was your initial response to the Trayvon Martin shooting? You know, after gathering all the information that we have, when you look at it, the genesis of that whole incident came about because somebody assumed that Trayvon was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, I would probably venture to guess that uh, that assumption was made because he was an African American. Uh, we tell our kids all the time, you know, don't be in the wrong place at the wrong time, don't hang out with the wrong people. In this case, this young man was walking home after going to a convenience store and someone made an assumption. They racially profiled this young man. They assumed that he was doing the wrong thing and the incident ended up in death. So it doesn't matter to you so much whether there was an altercation, whether George Zimmerman was being beaten. What matters to you is taking a couple of steps back and the genesis of this thing. If you consider where it started, if he didn't make a erroneous assumption that this young man was doing something wrong, he'd still be alive. So clearly, uh, his race played a huge role in his death, whether there was an incident or not. Uh, in addition to what I just stated, uh, the 911 caller, uh, they told him not to follow Trayvon, and he continued to do it. So clearly, you know, I don't want to, the issue for us today isn't, you know, was he stating his ground or not, but we do know that he made an erroneous assumption for some reason. Now, whether it was because of his color or not, I think most of the uh, surrounding circumstances, you would think that was the reason he pursued. Have we seen other cases of this happening in the national news that have gotten your attention? We really have. I mean, if people want to look up uh, Kenneth Chamberlain, Kenneth Chamberlain was a 68-year-old heart patient and he had the life alert system to aid him in terms of if he did have a heart attack, someone would come and uh, the hospital would be called, the emergency uh, people would come out and, and help him. For whatever reason, his life alert went off at five o'clock in the morning, uh, erroneously. He didn't push it, it just went off, maybe rolled over in the bed, he was asleep. The police were called out and the police knocked on the door and he told them, he said, hey, you know, I'm okay, uh, please go away. They did not leave. They continued to pursue until they eventually knocked his door in. And Mr. Chamberlain, a war veteran, ended up murdered, uh, killed by having a life alert. They thought that he was troubled because he was black? I have no, you know, I can't make that, that guess or I can't uh, speak for someone else. But the reality is this young, this, this man had a life alert uh, pendant that was that he paid for to save his life if he would have a medical emergency. The police were called and instead of leaving, when he told them that he was okay, they continued to stay. Now, why did they do that? What assumptions did they make when he said he was fine and it wasn't a call for anything other than a medical emergency? Those kinds of incidents cause you to say, you know, you know what's going on? Amando Diallo, who was shot 41 times in 1999, in New York when he had his wallet in his hand and the police thought he had a gun. I mean, why did he die? I mean, what assumptions were made uh, to make uh, someone think they needed to come with that kind of force to subdue him? I mean, 41 bullets uh, went into him. I mean, at, at the time, uh, President Clinton uh, 
made it a national priority to look at racial profiling. Later, uh, uh, President Bush did the same thing. In fact, he put that as one of his primary objectives. It's not something that should be lost on local or even that. This is something that impacts the entire country in so many ways. How widespread a problem is it in Fort Wayne? I think, you know, when you talk about racial profiling, uh, you know, Trayvon Martin, Kenneth Chamberlain, those are all aberrational. They're not going to happen to most people. But, you know, how many times does a guy go for a job and you make an assumption about who he is? Uh, are there issues that, that impact students in school in terms of stereotyping? Becoming aware of, you know, my own thoughts will allow me to make better decisions and I won't miss out on somebody who's a good candidate. Yeah, okay, I guess this is what I wanted to, to get at before we go to our first commercial break, and that is unpacking what you mean by racial profiling. People often think of it in a, in a law enforcement context. What you're saying is it goes beyond that and has real world effects in plenty of other areas. Okay, unpack for me how racial profiling happens in the classroom, in a job interview. Well, racial profiling or stereotyping. Stereotyping, um, sure. Uh, certainly, if you make an assumption about a student, and uh, you know, not because you're intentionally trying to do anything that's negative, but if your assumption is that this student can't do, then it becomes an issue that's going to blow up. Uh, I know I have a young man that I'm a big brother to, and he wrote an incredible paper, and his teacher read it, and she assumed that he plagiarized. Now, I don't, I can't say that uh, she did it because he was a African American. But she did it. And later, she had to apologize because he just happened to write a, a very good paper. What we need to make sure that we do is be aware of issues that make us make decisions sometimes that aren't based on anything besides a stereotype or really an unfounded belief. And, and it's tough because, correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, I don't know that you can ever say that somebody, maybe there are situations where you can, where you can definitively say somebody was stereotyping, somebody was profiling here. But it seems like more often what you're going to have are these cases that are, that are in the gray area where you may suspect that's what, go, what is going on, but, but maybe it's not. For instance, you know, the, uh, the case you, you just brought up, the same thing happened to me when I was in fifth grade. I, I was a white kid with a white teacher and, you know, the paper was handed back to me. I know that you copied this. I, and I didn't. So, so it seems like we're talking about an area that is very hard to, to grasp when it happens, right? That's why, you know, I'm glad that you had this program because it's not accusatory. It's awareness. So, you know, only you or the person who's perpetrating the issue knows for sure if this was based on color. But if we can make people aware that, hey, let's look inside, let's make sure that we're doing the right thing at all times, and remember that sometimes our experiences are not going to be the determining factor for who a person is or what their capabilities are. And awareness is a big part of understanding. More with Jonathan Ray in just a moment.
Focus 15 continues with Mark Millinger. We continue our discussion on race and discrimination in the Fort Wayne area with Jonathan Ray, president and CEO of the Fort Wayne Urban League. In what sphere of life does this cause the most problems, at least here in the Fort Wayne area? Does discrimination play, play uh, the biggest role in the criminal justice system, in education, in ability to get a job, what? I think, man, it's, it's hard to identify. All three of those areas are dramatic. I mean, if we just talked about law enforcement first, um, you know, if you have a group of people that, that don't trust uh, the protecting force, uh, they're going to be less likely to cooperate. They're going to be less likely to trust. And they may run uh, or, you know, move quickly when the police call them to stop. Is that what we have in Fort Wayne? I mean, I'm sure that some people have that fear and uh, causes them to react, uh, you know, inappropriately. And then on the other end, if you have law enforcement and they are making an assumption about who you are and what you'll do, they may react with more force than they normally would. And then when you talk about real life, we all need to eat and we all need to have somewhere to live. Getting a job plays a big role. I mean, are you going to make an assumption about my uh, cap uh, capabilities based on race? I mean, do I have to do more as a minority to show that it can be done? Is this your biggest concern? I mean, do you see this happening? African-Americans who, who can't get a job, you suspect because something in the interview, something about the interviewer wasn't right, he or she was making some wrong assumptions? Well, when you look at the statistics as it relates to employment, uh, you see that African American men are the lowest on the totem pole in terms of unemployment. I mean, their employment, unemployment level is extremely high. African Americans in general is extremely high. So when you, you put those numbers, it's not just an analogy or a maybe, those are facts. Uh, that they're less likely to get a job than others. I mean, the reality is a uh, college-educated African-American is less likely to get a job than a uh, majority high school graduate. So those are real-life issues that play a role. Now, how much uh, that's something, as I said before, is predicated on the interview or the person in the situation. It, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Why? What assumptions are commonly being made? Wrong assumptions. You know, I don't think it's a, uh, it's not, I don't think it's, we're talking about a hateful situation in most cases. We're not talking about someone who's, uh, you know, has these, these, these uh, you know, strange ideas about people. We have people who certainly are, are, are good individuals, but they're assuming something that is wrong. And when you make an assumption that leads you down a path, for, for instance, if I assume that north is south and I go out to, to drive north and I think it's south, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to head north no matter how fast or how far I go. If you make the wrong assumption based on an erroneous belief, then you will not be able to consider that person in the same light. And, and what are some of those wrong assumptions that you would like to, to take on and combat? This is a form to do that. Uh, you know, the bottom line, hear what they're saying. Look at their, uh, if we're talking about an interview, uh, you know, go into it with a veil of ignorance and allow the resume and uh, the way they present themselves and their references to tell you what kind of worker that individual is going to be. Be colorblind. Colorblind. Uh, if you're in a traffic situation uh, or you happen to engage with law enforcement, assume that the person is innocent. Assume that the person is not a criminal and then uh, proceed. Uh, just recently, I got stopped by the police and, and uh, I was stopped and the, the gentleman took my license and insurance information and he said, well, you know, if you don't have any warrants, I'll let you go. I mean, <laughs> I wonder where that came from. But, uh, you know, that happened. That's right. a real life scenario. So I guess what I'm saying is, 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 is be colorblind, uh, enter into a relationship without uh, thinking that you have the facts. Interesting what you said. You don't necessarily think that everyone who, who stereotypes or profiles with regard to, to race or ethnicity is racist. Ex right. Explain that. Well, I don't think that uh, you know, people who uh, end up uh, discriminating uh, necessarily are you know, hating uh, minorities or, mm -hmm. or want to be a part of the Ku Klux Klan. But if you have a belief that's wrong, if you assume that uh, one group is lazy or incompetent, if you assume that, then that's going to lead you to make a, a, a decision that impacts somebody the same way 
even if you uh, don't have hateful feelings. So we are in a situation now where the, the biggest problem in your mind is, is ignorance as opposed to maybe three or four decades ago it was hate or dislike. I think that's the case for most people. Uh, you know, most people are, don't have the hate, but a lot of people still have the stereotypes and beliefs that lead them to decisions that are wrong. So what do we do to begin to turn